kleine Auszeichnung. Greetings and welcome to the Ayurveda Report. I'm Kailas. Today on the show I have Light Miller. Light has over 35 years of experience practicing Ayurveda. She's my guru and she's also like a second mom to me so it's been really wonderful having her for here for the interview. And this interview is very special because I wanted to find out from her what her journey has been like. She's one of the pioneers who has brought Ayurveda to America. And she studied with Panchubai Chotai, who was one of Gandhi's personal physicians. In this interview, we talk about what it was like for her to go to India, literally to commute, to fly to India every couple of weeks to go and study with Panchubai, some of the ways that he taught her and some of the things that she learned. When my journey began, because I wanted to be a Western girl, well, you know, I wanted to be, and my father really wanted me to be a lawyer, an international lawyer and all that, and I just not mm. cut out for that because I had a lot of my grandmother in me who was an Ayurvedic um, herbalist, you know, oh, wow. and she really worked the plants and had neem trees everywhere, go out. Oh, into, wow. So when I went to, when I lived in India and the time visiting my grandmother was always, go, let's go harvest some herbs. She was always making something, and that was very... Uh, very much of my background because I watched grandma it was my going back to India as a little girl was watching grandma make stuff and helping grandma make stuff because I didn't live in India no, all the you time. You weren't living in India tell me a little bit about your father and where, how you grew up. Well my father was worked for the embassy and we did a lot of the he was a very simple man but he which he still is and he actually was the communication person for the Indian government to begin to open embassies around the world. He was a freedom fighter. Freedom fighter, yeah. She was a freedom fighter. And so when I was in school and I wanted to be like everybody else, I uh, met this man who gave me this book, The Autobiography of Yogi, which I know that is a book that has brought people back to their path. And meeting him opened a whole new way of Indian culture for me. Mm. He was a yogi and he had some connections and we ended up in California together and me being an interpreter for these two swamis to Central America. And that was the beginning opening for me to find myself. So you traveled find. with uh -huh. this this guy and two sannyasins? And two sannyasins. So we're real simple, real basic, mm. uh, truly holy people. So that brought me back to my own self and my own spirituality, my own roots. Okay. So that began. And then I, um, I met, I came back to the United States, I met my husband, and meeting my husband, who was doing a lot of herbal work already, oh, wow. and uh, had spent a lot of time with uh, Indian shamans and American Indian culture, um, and now I, I had brought forth lots of self-massage, and lots of oils, and I'd gone to massage school before that, and uh, we came together at the right time, at the right timing. You and Brian? I am Brian. And then we had our first child, and that he had all kinds of problems. And in having all kinds of problems, we started searching for medicine. Mm. And we moved to Hawaii at that point. And, but he was about a year old, and he had all these rashes and all these problems, and I'm nursing him. And that began our search of looking to natural medicine. Oh, wow. Because he was so deeply rooted in me. And what was a puzzle for both of us that we went to three different doctors and three different doctors gave us three different diagnostics. Mm. And it was as simple that we're living in Hawaii. I was getting a lot of pineapple. So my milk was very acid being so many pineapples. And I was, you know, my goal at that point was to be a fruitarian. Oh, wow. So we had practiced raw foods and to be a fruitarian. That was my ultimate goal. And to be a meditator and live in a cave and all that. And uh, so... By watching our sons being sick, we came back to this country and to the United States, from the, uh, to the mainland, and we found a, uh, Dr. Bernard Jensen. Oh. And uh, we decided at that point that we needed to understand the human body better. Uh, he was a chiropractor, right? He was a chiropractor, and yeah. Had Brian started mm -hmm. uh, his chiropractor? No, no, not yet. Yeah. Not, yet. That's, oh. uh, not yet. So Brian you know, went to him. Brian got a job, went to apply for a job with Dr. Browners. Mm -hmm. You know, this is 41 years ago. And uh, he, they refer us to Dr. Ben, uh, Benesh, which is a doctor that was really 
was it what they used to call naturopathic, true naturopathic doctors with food combining. And he says, we just have to get you off the milk for a while and put you, I'll colonize you. Huh. And that was the beginning path of my health picture. I mean, even though I was a vegetarian and all that, hmm. uh, that was the beginning path of me looking. And from there, Brian got some money and we decided to go to school. In those days, we have different schools. We had naturopathic school and chiropractic school together. And we both entered the path of that. But that did not last very long because homeopathics, I couldn't relate to homeopathics at the level. Um, uh, naturopath? And yeah. You know, and I was really a hands-on mm. plant person. Mm -hmm. And uh, we opened practice shortly mm -hmm. after that, just to make the story short. And we, we came back to California, and uh, we just discovered that, you know, I wasn't meant to do homeopathics. You know, this was oh. in my, that a plant was, herb teas were my thing. So wow. we went back to start using teas with the children and began to... Uh, to study even deeper first mm. at a plant. So, you, you know, this process about becoming, you know, who you really are as a practitioner, mm -hmm. yes. uh, you know, sometimes you have to go down some different mm -hmm. paths and then realize, oh, this is what this I'm is good what at. I'm good this at. is what I love. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is what I look at so many aspects of natural health. Yeah. So then I, my kids were getting older and I wanted to have a, a system of education for them. Mm -hmm. And we came here for the Waldorf schools. And to me, I love the philosophy of Waldorf education. They also have come from the Greek method of, of, uh, of uh, the Greek method of different body types. Oh, right. And right, okay. uh, then that sparkle something in me. And part of that program that I enter uh, to be a school teacher, to be able to teach my children up in a school for my kids, is because I wanted to homeschool them or have a system that was based on nature. Hmm. Uh, was finding myself to have foundation year. And in the discovery of that, I found out that I wasn't really a teacher that way of mm -hmm. teaching children, that I was a teacher of Ayurveda. Wow. Shortly after that, we opened practice. Brian became very chiropractic oriented and very nutrition oriented. Mm -hmm. And I still have this calling for basics mm. of plant materials and using simplicity. And uh, I began to play with essential oils. And he was like, that's when chiropractors were, have no licensing in many states, so he wanted to look good. And we had a little split in awareness at that point where he wanted to be this doctor with a suit and uh -huh. to be known, and I wanted to go back to bases. So I got sick from all the stress of the clinic and the kids and all that. And my mom says, you got to go back to India. You're not doing well. You're not looking healthy. Wow. I became very allergic to the substance we're using at the center. And, you know, I was around chemicals in the rugs and all that. Mm -hmm. became very sensitive. And that's when my mom said, you got to go back to India and have a bunch of karma. And I have my first mm -hmm. bunch of karma. And that just totally transformed my life. And who and, did the uh, bunch of karma? Uh, after my oh. lineage. But let, let's go back a little bit. And uh, I have met a doctor, and I, when I was sick, I've met a doctor that helped me with Kaya Kalpa uh -huh. first. And... Uh, I became his apprentice, mm -hmm. but I wasn't really learning anything. Mm -hmm. I was like his little slave, uh -huh. uh, not to mention names. I wasn't, so I wanted to learn more about Kaya Kappa because that, to me, that was the most transformative experience that people undergo, which you had it yourself and you know it changed your life. So I decided to, to, but in the meantime, trying to learn that and trying to learn, trying to keep a practice and a home, I got very depleted. Um, that's when my mom came and said, oh, you need to go and meet this. You need All to right. go to India and find a doctor. We found a doctor and it took him a while to find a Kaya Kappa practitioner. Mm -hmm. So I wanted somebody to have both. And he was right next door to someone, some of my relatives mm. as we were looking for a doctor. And one day I just entered the hut and he said he lived in a hut. And even in the middle of the city, he had a, uh, a dirt floor and he was meditating. And I entered and I said, I want to learn Kaya Kappa. And he says... Kaya Kappa, nobody does Kaya Kappa anymore. And I says, well, I learned some, and I don't want to go further into it. So, but I'm really looking right now for Panchakarma, because that's what I need. Mm -hmm. I need more of a physical help right now. And he says, well, I can do both. And we began, I began my learning, studying with him. I did 21 days of Panchakarma, oh, wow. and I totally healed. I mean, I had never, and when I end of 
the treatment, I, then the treatment says, where do I learn this? He says, well, you'll have to come back here. Mm. I, I, I think you told me once he said, I, I don't teach women. Or oh, yeah. Yeah, he was one of the things, he says, well, I don't teach, no, but no women don't do kayakapa. And I says, well, do panchakarma on me. And that was the beginning. Mm -hmm. And then we got to know me, and he wrote some my dedication, and he opened himself uh -huh. to do to do both. And then I train with him. I've actually, people complain about having to do one week in a month and having to travel to other cities, which a lot of times people come from New York and from other cities to work with me. And I went for two weeks at a time, thanks to my mother, to India to study, and my husband too. And we began to... Back and forth. You were commuting, forth. To commuting to India. Commuting to India, yes. Of course, we're living in Hawaii at that point. We okay. moved, and it was easier to travel to it was a still long trip, but mm -hmm. it was easy to travel, and that began my my training, and uh, it was an informal training. And this was with Panchabai? Yes, I was with Dr. Chotai. Oh, Dr. Panchabai Ch Chotai. Chotai. Yeah, Panchabai means brother, actually. Mm -hmm. And he was very dedicated, very simple. He was he happened to be the physician of, Mahag of Mahatma Gandhi during the fast and supervised the fast. Oh, and he wow. was very involved as a freedom fighter, and then we put things together, and he realized he knew my family, and... When we first went, we had no idea that we there was a connection mm -hmm. with him. But as we began to explore who we were, we realized that he knew my father, he knew my oh, family. Wow. It was like an incredible That's amazing. connection. I, you told me once that w when you got on the train, uh, he was so well respected that, what what was it, he got first class? Uh, he had first class, always in the train. Most freedom fighter, fighters are. Mm -hmm. They can travel to India, they don't pay for anything right, in, the, in, the, right. in the transportation system of any systems, planes either, oh, they wow. are allowed to travel. So anyhow, I began to travel with him and learn the herbs, and it was very basic because you know, he took me places where they actually ground the herbs, and you know, so I learned a lot. It was an incredible experience mm -hmm. uh, for me and for my husband to be able to, we are very lucky mm -hmm. to be able to meet him and yeah. be able to study Did with Did Panchabai ever tell you about Gandhi uh, and his relationship with the nature cure or with that? Yes, well, I did my apprenticeship of Panchakarma in the nature, Uruli, nature Cure Center mm -hmm. with him. And uh, a lot of my work as a Panchakarma was working with very sick people in Panchakarma. Oh, wow. In Uruli. In very simple, a very simple uh, type environment, of clinic, very right? simple type of clinic. Not it's like a spa. Not like learning, a spa. Uh, you know, <laughs> when I came back and uh, things were happening in the United States, when I returned from Hawaii to, to the mainland, I was amazed. People were talking about the spa treatments, and I couldn't even relate right. to spa treatments. And you know, to me, you had a bowl with oil that you put in, you know, and you had a dirt floor and. Uh, the nature cure sent to cure everything that they needed was fresh. Hmm. Grown you know, there. Grown there. Uh, if you came from the village, but mm -hmm. everything was fresh. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things about a nature cure center is that they juice every day, mm -hmm. and they juice the fresh tulsi with sugarcane juice, oh, wow. and they do all the plant ashwagandha fresh. And and Dr. Chatai had worked with uh, was one of the beginners of teachers of Dr. Wigmore. Dr. Shatai have worked with, had taught Dr. Wigmore about wheatgrass, and, and she never gave him credit for it. Well, she cured herself from cancer, and mm -hmm. that started the whole wheatgrass, the whole wheatgrass thing, thing in America, thing in America. And that, that yeah. came from Panchabai Chotai. It was Pancho Chotai. It came from yeah. him. And unfortunately, she never, she died and never gave him credit for right. it. But what sparked to me is that I knew about her, and the man that I was previously with that brought me to my spirituality, oh. he had studied with Dr. Wigmore, mm -hmm. and I had... Met, and one day oh, I'm wow. looking through his pictures and I saw that I saw Dr. Wickman and says, I know this woman. He says, yes, she studied with me. And that's how the conversation started. And, uh, you know, he grew beautiful mm. wheatgrass all around the hut. Oh, wow. It was incredible, the wheatgrass. So I have incorporated that teaching mm -hmm. to my panchakarma, as you know, because you practice uh, panchakarma. So I was beginning the journey. And then from there, uh, at that point, uh, we moved back to the, from the mainland to the United States and all these clinics started opening up and I was teaching basic Ayurvedic uh, massage, 
and my husband's chiropractic clinic, which chiropractic in those days was the main income for our family because mm -hmm. nobody knew about Ayurveda. Right. And uh, we began to slowly begin to teach and integrate a little bit of Ayurveda within our patients and uh -huh. things like that. And not as we do it today, but mm -hmm. just beginning to, be, to bring back the essence of Ayurveda. Then Maharishi came along, mm -hmm. and many other people came, and things began to, Dr. Lat arrived, mm -hmm. and the movement began to happen, mm -hmm. and uh, then we formed an association. You know, I see. And, uh, I Tell was, me a little bit about uh, when you were training with Dr. Chotai, mm -hmm. um, how was his teaching style? Uh, very simple. Paul's here and had no idea what I was doing. No, not much education in that way. Paul's here, what do you feel? And I was like, how what he felt. Well, go get those herbs and bring them to me and let's mix them together. Mm -hmm. So very raw, very simple. Uh, go outside and do some wheat grass and mix it, mix it with this, you know. Very, very simple. The, t the practical stuff. The practical like you stuff. You need to know how to make this medicine. Yeah, you need to, you need how to make a medicated oil. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to go out there and a lot of on the land type harvesting. Mm -hmm. We will go places and harvest herbs and we'll dry them. The whole hut will be filled with herbs. And the amazing thing is that he had over 50 to 100 people come every day to Pulse. Oh, and wow. our job, which I think he still does, I haven't been to India in a few years now, he still does, and people will gather, and then we hand them the little bags of herbs, you know. Okay. Very similar to the Ayurveda, the art of living. Right. Very the similar to that, that, you know. Yeah. We'll grab the herbs, he'll say, give that, give those roots, and people will come with big bags of herbs. Uh -huh. So that which you see in, uh, in the Ayurveda, the art of living, was very similar to my mm -hmm. training, you know. Right. Uh, whenever yeah. I see that, movie, I, which I showed to the students a lot, uh -huh. which brings me back to my memory of learning oh, wow. because I really was, what I knew from my grandma and what I knew from him was all basic, mix this together, bring this here, these two herbs go together. It was very simple. And what about with the body work? How did he train in the body work? I, I assisted him with a lot of the treatments and uh, assisted a lot. The, with the Shirdara. Mm -hmm. Everything was hands-on. I didn't have, I kind of say I had a formal training and I went, that's why I don't have a BMSA or anything like right. that. I really trained hands-on. Right. You know, Full-on apprenticeship. Full-on apprenticeship. Get those herbs and I will wash and mix and sometimes I will have to ask as I tell you later. Mm -hmm. And then I'll have to wait until he wasn't seeing someone to tell me why did he mix those all things together. And that's and that's where it's nonlinear. That's where you have to really want that mm -hmm. information yes. because they're going to walk on to the next page. He'll say, bring me some raisins. This is very bitter tea. And we'll put some raisins uh -huh. into it. We'll add some dates to the tea. And i never seen dates on a tea, you know. Right. Or, and it was like mind-blowing to me. Or um, the we'll secrets. brew some herbs. <laughs> we'll brew some herbs. And, uh, and they'll chant over the earth. One mm -hmm. of my greatest mm -hmm. training is that if we have patients the next day that he saw that day that we didn't have the herbs, we'll spend like two hours sometimes in prayer to bless the herbs, you know. And he was very conscious of remembering the patients and what their illnesses right, were. Right, right. Keeping them in his mm -hmm. heart and mm -hmm. uh, being a stand for their healing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. also part of the embodying piece. For me, it's, it, you know, I practice that way too. Patients are always amazed that I remember all their problems. Mm -hmm. And one of my greatest teachings from him was that he looked at the root. He just didn't give you a pill. Yes, of course, he gave you herbs. He gave you, which I still practice like that, and I encourage my students to practice like that, as you know, being one of my graduates, that we need to get to the root of the problem. Right. Uh, one of the things that he taught me was tarpana, mm -hmm. emotional work. Mm -hmm. He always says, if you, you can give people the best herbs and the best tonifying herbs and the best cleansing herbs, if you don't get to the root and the root cause of the problem, you cannot heal from within. Mm -hmm. You know, I, 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 in, my, in my memory of listening to him always, why does, tell me your story, tell me why you're there. Mm -hmm. Tell me why this situation is happening. So he, mind and body for him were so an integrated part of his practice, it still is an integrated part of his practice, you know, and touch, for him touch, 
being able to touch your patient, you know, mm-hmm. being able to, to be with them, being able to hear to the story and the, le- the problems. Uh, I think one of the greatest gifts that he's given me is look at disease as, as the weaknesses of the parents will pass on to their children. Wow. You know, and uh, to me, for many generations, and if you don't address the root cause, for example, if you have heart problems, what's in your heart? Mm-hmm. And who do you inherited that from? Right. You know, like he used to say, which we still teach a lot, um, if you have if you have someone in the family that has a heart or diabetes, let's use diabetes for example, and he will say things that the person is not really enjoying the sweetness of life. Oh, right on. You know, so that's passed on to the children, you know. So, for example, I had someone the other day that had deep depression, and I work with that, you know, and it, it was very rooted in her from very early in childhood for her. Mm-hmm. And we were able to get to the source of her pain and her depression, you know. So I think that's one of the greatest, greatest gifts that I give, I've given my students. And the Brian and I bring into Ayurveda is the mm-hmm. tarpana, the looking at the at the at the karmic mm-hmm. and engulfment that has happened through generations. Right, right, because right. if you if there haven't been sweetness in your family, you're gonna carry that desire to find sweet in your life. And how do we find sweets? We eat sugar, we eat grains, we eat a lot, massive amount of things that will make us feel good. Right. Getting, I, I think the biggest gift for me in my training was getting to the root cause of the problems. You know, So for me, uh, tarpana is really important, which is looking at the ancestral patterns mm-hmm. and being able to release and forgive mm-hmm. and do ceremonial rituals to those ancestors to be able to get to that point that you get to see how diseases transfer from generation to generation. And if one generation doesn't break the pattern, it continues, the disease continues, you know. I think that this whole discovery of the gene of cancer, I think that if we do cleansing, Mm -hmm. emotionally and physical, Mm -hmm. it can heal cancer, Mm -hmm. you know. Because cancer is a self-attack. Like all, we suffering in the society of autoimmune diseases. Right. That means that we're attacking ourselves. Yeah. When the body begins to attack itself, itself, that means that it's a society that's not looking at the true Atman, the true soul. Right. Yeah. Right. In your early days of practice, uh, a lot of the Ayurvedic herbs that we can get today uh, online, for example, uh, were not available in the United States. Um, mm-hmm. So you made some adjustments, and, mm-hmm. and and I wanted to ask you about that process. Well, you know, one of the things I discover by Brian having a, a Western herbalism is that the herbs that are in a society are for the people in that society, mm-hmm. and the Western herbs are so powerful. Mm-hmm. You know, they if you look at the lineage of American Indian and the amount right. of herbs that are in this country, right. um, and many of the herbs were carry. I will imagine. Uh, as the travelers came, mm-hmm. as the pioneers came, uh, because Kashkura, for example, is an herb that is used highly in this country. It grows everywhere in California. Right. You and know, how did it get here? That makes me think mm-hmm. about this United States and this North American continent so rich in medicine. Mm-hmm. Amazon, so rich in medicine. Mm-hmm. Uh, that thought just occurred to me about how prolific yeah, it is. Yeah, so, you know, and there's some herbs that we can uh, replace. Like, you're not going to be able to replace Haritaki. You're not going to be able to replace uh, Ashwagandha as a tony mm-hmm. fine herb. But there's so many wonderful herbs that we have available in this country. So I have integrated in my practice this an integration of herbs. And, of course, I practice a lot with whole herbs, which is very hard on me because right now there's very few companies, Ayurvedic companies, that I'm bringing whole herbs oh, into the country. So, you know, most of them have gone into powders. I don't know if it's political reasons or what, but we well, having problems getting whole herbs in this mm-hmm. country. Mm-hmm. And it's just still, a few still we are. You know, yeah. not just 30 years ago you couldn't yeah, get certain yeah. whole herbs. Yeah, coming. in those days I used to have uh, people bring them families, send them to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, we stopped because as Ayurveda grow, these little families that were growing it became hard for them to send them. So as Bazaar of India, Vadik herbs came around and 
Banyan came and other companies that started buying from them. But at the beginning, all the herbs came directly from India. And, and mm -hmm. of course, Brian had a background. Uh, and I also work a lot very closely with a woman named Brigitte Mars, mm -hmm. which actually she introduced me to Brian. Oh, wow. And uh, she was an herbalist already, and she knew a lot about Western herbs. So I will say my Western education also came from Brigitte. Oh, wow. Which uh, many people know who she is because she's a very famous herbalist in this country. So, you know, as, as it's, it's, it's hard. It's not easy. I, right now I have a, a full garden of a lot of the Ayurvedic herbs. Like I'm growing three different kinds of Tulsi in our, mm -hmm. in our practice. We have, we're very lucky. We have almost a quarter of an acre. That's great. And we're growing curry leaves and we're growing, uh, I mean, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. we, we have Goshkura right on our yard. We have stevia, which is a, a South American herb. So mm -hmm. I make the tea so sweet now wow. that people then go, oh my God, how am I going to drink this tea? We have different kinds of mint. We have a lot of herbs growing in our garden right mm -hmm. now. And that's my goal right now is to, wherever I go from Florida, is to create herbal gardens. I mm -hmm. think that we don't know what's going to happen to the herbal system in this country. And I think growing herbs is really important. If you have a little small space mm -hmm. that you can grow herbs, I think it's going to be really important. No one knows what's going to happen to herbs. And because we don't know, we need to be prepared. Right, you know? right. And saving seeds, I mean, of anything, like sprouting and... I think, we don't know, we're in a very uh, in time of flex. Right, and even if, uh, even if something happens uh, to our ability to get access to herbs uh, for uh, half a generation, or maybe it's only five years, or maybe it's three years or two years, the, 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 the Ayurveda is going to suffer in that amount of time. So maybe mm -hmm. as practitioners, having the skill to grow our own herbs, even mm -hmm. if it's a small amount, yes. it's going to make a difference. Yes, for sure. You know, our, our garden was actually created by the permaculture uh -oh. because our sand in Florida is very poor. So I had a student who had trained in permaculture. So we have high beds and very well insulated to really make the soil rich. I learned a lot in the process of growing this garden because mm. I've never been a plant person. But my mother's a plant person. A green thumb. So a green thumb. So I'm learning a lot about the garden and I'm hoping that wherever I go, there will always be plants available. Mm -hmm. And you know, Tulsi grows in almost tropical environments. Mm -hmm. Tulsi grows everywhere. And uh, so many of the herbs can grow everywhere. But you know? there's, a, there's a point at which, you know, you're looking for something to help heal a person. And you don't, you can't find the one in the book, right? And so you have to kind of know how to research and create alternatives. And I mm -hmm. feel like one of your big contributions is to, you know, bring uh, the knowledge of aromatherapy, for example, mm -hmm. into the context of Panchakarma and the knowledge of the Western herbs into mm -hmm. the context of Ayurveda. Because it really, uh, maybe between China and India, there was a time when there was a cross-pollination in herbal medicine. Mm -hmm. But and I don't believe that's the case uh, with Western herbs. Uh, I think there is. Like I was saying before, uh, there's so much Kashkura here in, in, the, in, the, in California, you mm -hmm. know. I mean, I'm amazed when people tell me, oh, they got this Kashkura from, especially in northern, in northern uh, California. Uh, I think the herbs are here. Mm -hmm. I think they might have been integrated, a lot of them have integrated. Mm -hmm. Maybe they came through seeds, people mm -hmm. traveling, like I don't know, but it's amazing. How many, especially the tropical climates, like subtropical like Florida, we have an incredible amount of Ayurvedic herbs. Mm -hmm. you know? but, but I mean, what, what was your process where you're looking for things to help people and you had to make a decision well, you know, one time, this is really funny, I was teaching a, uh, a class in Canada. Mm -hmm. This is a really fantastic story. I thought that story. I had to say. One time it was really funny. One time, it was, this is really funny, I was teaching a class at a botanical garden in Vancouver. And these people were just listening to me speak about the different herbs. So they were actually mm -hmm. grown in the botanical garden. Mm -hmm. And the man stopped me, he says, my wife has diabetes, and... Uh, there's a plant that you were pointing at that's good for diabetes that is in, I have it in my yard. Oh. So it began by looking at the fact that people do have herbs in their backyards. And many of the times, the herb that they need is right in the backyards. Wow, right. You know, and that's when my became the biggest awakening, my God, he has that plant mm -hmm. and uh, it's in his 
it's in his backyard. Mm -hmm. You know, so that, because as you know, the plant that you were pointing at, and to be honest with you, I can't even remember at this moment the name of the plant, but it's a plant that was good for diabetes. And uh, it wasn't Jimena Silvestre, it wasn't anything like that. It was a Western plant. Uh -huh. And uh, I think it's called Sweet Leaf. I want to say Sweet Leaf. Many years ago, this is about 25 years ago. And he says, but that grows in my garden. Uh -huh. uh, wheat, he's a wheat in the backyard. And of course, the we're weed. talking about the Northwest. That So looking at weeds was the beginning mm. workings. And we need to learn our weeds right now because we don't know what's happening with our food systems. And there's so much food that we can still eat. Right. Out of the wild. Right, you know? because weeds are um, non-domesticated, they're natural agriculture, mm -hmm. and we just think it's a weed because we're growing the corn over here or the pumpkins the over pumpkins here, is, right? Yes, but actually yes. it's food. It's food, yeah. So <laughs> I'm always medicine. amazed when I go to, uh, for example, in Washington State or New York, mm -hmm. you know, like Red Root, grows everywhere in New Jersey, right, and, right. and uh, anywhere, anywhere in New Jersey you see Red Root. You know, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is great for the lymphatic system. Right. Or in chamomile everywhere in northern in, Washington. Mm -hmm. And even here, echinacea. dandelion, echinacea, yep. so many wild plants. So I think wild edibles is another stage of integration for Ayurveda in uh -huh. this country because uh -huh. we live here. And we don't know. You know, right now, mm -hmm. something is happening between governments. They're not allowing the, the plants to come from... Yeah, so, so that's another thing I mean, yeah. that there's a movement in, uh, in the governments of the world to stop uh, practitioners from being able to procure the herbs that they need. Yes, yes, it's, it's happening. Sure. Well, a lot of it is also, you know, uh, I think that people are making so many pills, you know, and we're forgetting how the importance of tea for prevention again. Uh, which, you know, uh, I'm big on yeah, prevention, yeah. and so much can be prevented when we're drinking tea on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. The right teas for your weakness and your strength, mm -hmm. you know, to really enhance your system. Mm -hmm. I think that drinking teas yeah. might be the only way we're mm -hmm. going to be able to heal right, ourselves. Right, because we're not going to be able to get powders and stuff, so it's going to be... We like, don't know. If you grow the herb, you can always put it in a tea. That's you don't right. have to go through the drying process and then grinding mm -hmm, under certain mm -hmm. conditions and encapsulating. You know, and I have fresh stevia in the garden and I tell you my teas have gone a notch in quality mm -hmm. because I just put it right, especially for French karma, just go harvest. One of my biggest joys in the morning is go and harvest the tulsi and harvest uh -huh, the, uh -huh. the hawthorn berries and harvest nice. all the herbs I have to be we have like we planted three moringa trees. Oh wow. That's yeah. wonderful. And that's like a common plant in India, the candlestick yeah. tree. Drumstick. Yeah, yeah, drumstick, and yeah, uh, drumstick, yeah. And we have, we've been eating the seeds and wow. cooking them and, you know, so I think that so much can be done just in your own little yard. I'm so happy in South Florida because people are so easy. They remember their grandmothers, they remember what mm. the nature. Uh, having a, a total Hispanic community, a large Hispanic community, makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some brainwash. Right, we haven't lost. They haven't lost, lost the essence of yes. herbalism. I mean, they remember Grandpa going to the mountains and harvesting herbs and roots and bringing the roots back. I had a, a client that her, her, she remembers grandfather grading the maca root mm -hmm. from Peru, grading the macro root. He used to go yeah. and harvest it. And, right. and now it's in packages. Right, <laughs> right. And that was critical for his life and his family's life. Mm -hmm. He needed mm -hmm. to get that root created. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, if he yeah. that root, he didn't have energy, you know. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. That's what I explain to people. They say, well, why would I take, you know, I don't want just a whole bunch of bottles of herbs and stuff. And I say, yeah, but if you think about it, herbs are food. And mm -hmm. the amount of you know, necessary things to go through, you know, in the old days, uh, you had to have this plant and that plant. You, and maybe I put ashwagandha in all of our in a lot of our soups, you know, and just throw a few roots of ashwagandha. Exactly. Unfortunately, I'm having trouble getting ashwagandha in the root form, as you know. Um, you know, it's so hard to get now. Right. Right. Still, a couple of companies is cut and sifted at least, mm -hmm. and still put in a soup. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I've been moving the line into shakes. Mm -hmm. Doing lots of shakes with these powders. We have all these powders. Might as well right. make them into shakes. You know, 
So I mean, uh, I have a many shakes, mm -hmm. like liver flush and things like that. How do you like get that. around the, the thing where uh, we don't want to have too too much cold going in to put out the acne? Uh, sometimes I have them. The real vata people have them do with warm water. Oh, so you're lukewarm mm -hmm. shakes or lukewarm room temperature shakes, shake? Room temperature shakes. That'll be for the... Nothing cold, nothing mm -hmm. cold, yes. Mm -hmm. Still keeping it warm. Uh, I have a depression, have a depression shake, wow. have a anxiety shake. Because we have all these powders and a lot of the times yeah. I cannot get... Uh, and the anxiety has a shanka push fee. And this is in your has, cookbook? Yeah, no, no, but it could turn into a cookbook. Okay. Yeah, it could turn into a cookbook. Um, right now, I need to finish the pregnancy because I think mm -hmm. uh, a thirty, I, if pregnancy and infertility, and thirty per thirty-five percent of the women in America are infertile. Wow, it's a high percentage. That's very high as big yeah. as ours. Yeah, so I really want to work with a, because I think when a mother is, when a woman is wanting to have a child, there's an instinct that happens. And I also believe that it's through the womb of the mother that the world will change. Mm. Not to knock you guys down, but I think it's uh, okay. I, I think that it's a, it's a feminine size, is the goddess the awakening. The facts are the facts, right? You can't yeah. dispute them. The awakening of, 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 our, of our evolution is going to come through the womb of the mother. And I think because the mother are pregnant, they begin to feel life. Mm. So you're you're also talking about a well nourished womb mm -hmm. is going to change the world, mm -hmm. not just any womb, but a, a womb that's full of love and, and full love of Ayurveda and, nature, and full of of wanting to do the right thing mm -hmm. for your baby, mm -hmm. wanting to have as much nature around for your baby. Mm -hmm. I think that's uh, uh, want to provide simplicity mm -hmm. to your child. It's a process. For more content on Ayurveda, healing, yoga, and Vedanta, follow Kailas. If you need an Ayurvedic consultation, I am available internationally over Skype and Google Plus, and you can get more information about how to get an Ayurvedic consultation by clicking here. And if you're in Los Angeles, schedule an appointment. And remember, I'm available for workshops, presentations, and consultations in your city. I look forward to hearing from you and I welcome you to my practice. So take these blessings for your journey. Ashurvad. Namaste.